There's nothing worse than that guy who talks for hours about what's wrong with stuff but hasn't one single good idea about what to do to fix it. I can't stand that. I can't stand that. Give me something. So look, this podcast is not about belaboring how messed up stuff is. You know stuff's messed up. We're all tired unto death of hearing about how screwed we all are. This podcast is about what to do about it, or exploring ideas of what to do about it. How to change our minds, our worldviews, our orientations with principles and practical philosophies that we can put to work in our daily lives. We do need to understand and be clear about the problems we're working with, though. So we got to talk about problems a little bit. We want to solve for the problems we've actually got and not the problems we think we've got. And the first problem we need to address is that we're not as free as we need to be, as we ought to be. Certainly not free enough to meet this century head on, much less make a positive difference in it. I, for one, blame consumer ideology. You're listening to Advanced Retro Adaptics. I'm Tyler Disney. Welcome. Consumer ideology really has us by the short and curlies. I'm not going to beat this dead horse. Look, we all, we all know, we've seen Fight Club, right? We know consumer culture is this hyper-real, disnified simulacrum of real human experience that chews up human dreams and excretes mouths with wallets. Yawn, change the channel, we know, we know, we know. But what most of us don't know is what to actually do about it. How to engineer our own escape from this ticky-tacky dystopia apocalypse of plastic existence. Of course, this is how dominant cultures work. They make the dominant way of thinking seem like the only way of thinking by not talking about it at all, by quietly and inexorably corrupting and assimilating any countercultural thought that threatens it. What do you do when you, for the first time, learn about how insidious consumer culture is? Well, I hopped online and looked for a t-shirt to buy with some edgy words that perfectly captured my edgy, ironic stance against consumerism. And then I clicked Add to Shopping Cart. Obviously, that was the wrong move, but... The point is that the dominant culture doesn't care what you say you think as long as it owns your ass, as measured by what you do. Consumerism is a belief structure that any problem can be solved with money. Toilet plugged? Call a plumber. Hungry? Order pizza. Bored? Get a Netflix subscription. Unhappy? There's pills for that. Lonely? We got an app for that. As long as you reflexively believe that life's problems are resolved with money, consumer culture owns you. Because to get that money to solve your problems, you have to earn money. You have to work full-time, more than full-time. It fills your mind and occupies your time. And look, what what the hell am I yammering on about here? Freedom, consumer mindset, etc. My vision for the society that I want to live in is that it's full of people who are in touch with intrinsic motivation who bring a sense of play and joy and curiosity and novel experiences to their everyday lives. My vision for society is people who are broadly competent at whatever they want to be broadly competent at. I don't care if they know how to change oil or not. I think that this coming century, and probably the one after that, is going to be a bit of a ruckus show. And the consumer mindset that we've all been brought up with isn't going to cut it. It's not good enough. It hasn't equipped us, mentally speaking, to deal with the challenges we've got. With a consumer mindset, we say, right, okay, climate change, I get it. What can I buy to fix it? Wrong question. With a consumer mindset, we go, right, there's going to be political strife and demographic shifts. Where can I put my money to help? If you have enough money, that might be the right question, but probably wrong question. Hey, the internet is full of fake news. Whose substack should I subscribe to? Who can tell me what's true? Wrong question. Hey, I think disasters might hit my local area. What kit can I buy to make sure I'll be okay? Which store can I go to to make sure I get enough ammunition? 
wrong question, wrong way of thinking, I think. As a people, we are going to have to apply a lot of creativity to our lives, to this world, to our society over the next many decades. We need to be equipped with a more appropriate mindset to how to go about being useful citizens of this century. And so that's one reason why the consumer mindset, frankly, upsets me. It's like putting blinders on. It's like taking sunglasses and spray painting the outside and putting them on. It's like sending people to the Arctic in boxer shorts. But really, the most insidious, I'm going to use this word a lot in this episode, the most insidious thing about it is that it keeps us busy. It keeps us mostly busy on meaningless stuff, stuff that doesn't matter. We could be spending our time learning a new mindset, learning new skills, learning to come together, building community, building ourselves, undoing past traumas, becoming stronger people, becoming stronger citizens of this century. But we don't have the time for it because we've got to work so much because our rent is $3,000 a month. And we do this to ourselves, but this was done to us. It's, it's one of these weird things. You know, there's a lot of people talking about the meta crisis and what it means. And there's, there's no one to point a finger at. There's no silver bullet solutions. There's nothing simple about any of this, right? Like that is the insidious thing. I'm going to add a counter now. How many times I use that word? That's the insidious thing to this is that no one is trapping us. We can do whatever we want. We have the freedoms on paper. We have the freedoms, but the dominant ideology has us completely wrapped up in bars that we made ourselves and it doesn't give us the tools we need to be able to notice that the door isn't locked. We can open the door and step out. It's not that simple. It's actually quite difficult. Changing your paradigm, changing how you think about the world is not easy. None of what I'm talking about on this podcast is easy. I had Weird Al Yankovic's um, Amish Paradise stuck in my head the other day. That happens to me like once a week. Hard work and sacrifice. It's going to take hard work and sacrifice, right? Like this is not that sexy, except when it is because you're free and unstressed and competent and your cortisol levels have dropped and you've gotten into health and fitness and all of a sudden you look great naked and um, now you are sexy. So yeah, okay, fuck it. It's sexy. Indirectly, that's not the point of it. But, you know, eventually it becomes sexy is what I'm trying to say. I talk in this episode about intrinsic motivation. It's this sort of, I don't even know what to call it. It's a state of being, it's an experience where you are exploring and creating and making and testing and experimenting because you want to, not because it's going to work out in the end. In fact, you might fail a bunch of times and that's fine. You don't care because it's, it's, it's fun. You like it, whatever it is that you like to do, whether that's, you know, you might like to do things by yourself. You might like to do things with other people. You might like to do things by yourself and then show them to other people. You might, you might like to do things with other people and then look at it by yourself and, and grin about how great it is. Like whatever your deal is, to be intrinsically motivated to do something is this kind of holy grail of, of human experience. And so much of the way our current society is set up is designed to block you from being able to engage in intrinsic motivation. A prerequisite for intrinsic motivation is a sense of autonomy, of freedom, of I freely choose to do this activity. And in studies, if you take something that someone enjoys doing and then you pay them for it, whether in candy or dollars or whatever, the, the joy they get from it goes down and their performance goes down because they're just not as psyched on it anymore. And the idea is that that is because their sense of agency went down. They're like, well, am I doing this because I really love this or am I doing this just because someone's paying me money or marshmallows or whatever? So this is why I think having and getting autonomy is so important. And, I, and in this episode, I'm only hinting and suggesting at ways to get your freedom but this episode is not about showing how to get your freedom. It's about convincing you that it's really important, that it's worth a lot. It's worth a lot of hard work and sacrifice, frankly, to get. And I think this episode is about trying to paint a picture of how we're not as free as we like to think we are. Autonomy is prerequisite. That's why after the introduction, this is the first episode because we need to get our autonomy. And it's not about getting your autonomy and your freedom so you can do whatever you want. 
It's about getting your autonomy and freedom so that you can do whatever you want, so that your light can shine, so that you can your gifts can be expressed in the world and that you can join all of the other people who are expressing their gifts and bringing their light to the world to help make it less dark. Because we're going into a wild time and there's going to be a lot of darkness this century. And the more people who are free and able to shine, the better. Also, it's just way funner. It's way funner to be free. My level of freedom has gone up considerably in the last two years. I don't consider myself totally free. I'm not there yet. I'd like to. I'm still working quite hard on it. But hey, you know what? My life is better. Also, I spend way less money than I used to, right? Because that thing I talk about, I'm going to talk about this every single episode. Quality of life or abundance, however you want to think about it, is a function of money and skills. I've been working on my skills. I don't need to spend as much money to have as good of a life as I used to because I, I, I use skills, a whole variety of skills, which I'm going to get into soon, next episode probably, so that I just don't need to spend that much. My cost of living right now is less than $10,000. And my life is way better than when I was spending $70,000 a year. The great lie of consumerism is that quality of life is proportionate to money, how much you have, how much you can get. It's insidious because it's a half-truth. It's a lie by omission. By stating that quality of life is a function of money, it makes people believe that money is the only way to influence quality of life. And this just isn't so. A truth that can set us free is that quality of life is a function of money and skills, appropriate skills. The more relevant skills you have, the less money it takes to maintain a certain standard of living. Uh, I am talking about skills like how to unclog your own toilet or change your own oil, but I'm also talking about skills like the ability to sense when you're being unreasonable, or the self-knowledge about why you get so angry when fill in the blank, the ability to listen, to really listen to a friend who's having a tough time, the skill of being able to sit quietly on a rock and look at trees for an hour and feel content and at peace with the world, the skill of going over to a friend's house who's having a hard time and turning their living room into a raging dance party that spills into the streets. So I'm going to talk a lot more about skills later, but for now, understand this. The more relevant, appropriate skills you have, the less money you need to have a good life. The less money you need, the less time you have to spend working. The less time you have to spend working, the more time you can spend doing whatever the hell you want. The more time you spend doing whatever the hell you want, well, I mean, that's kind of the definition of freedom, isn't it? Or it's a definition of freedom. Autonomy personal sovereignty, freedom of action. It can be yours for the taking. You can have your life back. And you don't have to get lucky. You don't have to win the lottery. You don't have to make techie wages. You can free yourself. Of course, you may be thinking to yourself, well, Tyler, I happen to like my job, or the paid work I do is important and I want to continue doing it. That's great. Some people are fortunate to have found or created roles for themselves that are meaningful and where they have a lot of flexibility and where there isn't a whole lot of organizational dysfunction. I'm not saying everyone should quit their jobs. I'm saying people should free themselves so they can do whatever they want. And if what they want is role X at company Y, then that's grand. But it is far better to not need to work so much for the reasons you go to work to be because it's important and I like it and I'm respected and, you know, whatever your intrinsic motivations are, rather than because if I stop going, the paychecks stop, and if the paychecks stop, I won't be able to pay rent or buy food for my family. It's well documented that if external rewards are introduced to an activity that brings someone intrinsic motivation, that intrinsic motivation fades. So having external rewards for an activity literally sucks the joy out of the activity. A suggested mechanism for this is that a sense of agency is required for intrinsic motivation. External rewards erode one's sense of agency, and thus one's intrinsic motivation. So it's far better to not need the paycheck. I mean, from a neuroscience perspective, it's probably best to not get paid at all, to only do exactly whatever you want to do and have income and external reward be totally decoupled from your important work in the world. But if you feel the need to be in a traditionally compensated activity, it's best to have the sense that you could quit at any time and not earn another cent for years and be fine. That way, you own your job and not the other way around. There's another reason to secure your freedom, though, and that's the issue of intellectual sovereignty. So there's this quote I love. 
It's difficult to believe something that your paycheck requires you not to. So no institution is without its flaws, even the best of them. And groupthink, to some extent, is fairly inevitable. That groupthink is much harder to resist if your continued material comfort, food, shelter, etc., depend on you not rocking the boat. And we're coming up on some turbulent times, <laughs> folks, and upheavals in the ways things work is necessary. Like, there's a lot of things that we're doing that we need to do differently. We need more boat rockers. But humans tend not to like change. They'll resist it. So if you're committed to the work of adapting to the future, you're going to run into situations where the right thing to do is to rock the boat a bit. And it'll be a lot easier to do so if you just don't need the money. In other words, there's going to come a time when having FU money is going to come in handy. You might not need to use it, but having it will help you follow through on doing the right thing, on acting with integrity. Now, most people associate FU money with billionaires, really wealthy people. And this is where a very low cost of living is magic. It doesn't take very much cash to qualify as FU money if you spend barely anything. I consider three to seven years of living expenses liquid to be a few money territory. I mentioned this in the first episode, but another reason to increase autonomy is because I think the century is going to get wild. Like Some epic shit is going to be happening, and honestly, I want to be in it. I definitely don't want to be stuck behind a desk while there's epic stuff going down, and I want to stay agile enough to be able to pivot and go chase down interesting opportunities for action and engagement. When the post-apocalyptic surf is up, in other words, I want to be able to drop what I'm doing, grab my board, and hit the beach. And this really comes back to what we know about the neuroscience of intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is defined as something like a joyful, play-like activity of overcoming challenges and coping with unfolding circumstances. That sounds great. It also sounds really relevant to the kind of future we're going to have to be living through. I mean, it's like, Intrinsic motivation is the holy grail of human experiences, whether you're exploring a forest, an intellectual pursuit, a project at work, or, you know, the mysteries of the human spirit. Whatever it is, whatever you're exploring with that sense of play, intrinsic motivation is the dry, boring term we use to describe the state of being exuberantly alive. So, yeah, I'll take another, please, and I'll do whatever is necessary to preserve my ability to access it. Of course, corporations know this and go to great lengths to try to get their employees to feel intrinsically motivated at work, which is ironic because the modern workplace couldn't be better designed to crush intrinsic motivation if it tried. External rewards, inflexible expectations, performance demands, bureaucracy, groupthink, distraction. It's an excellent environment for starving people of the prerequisites for intrinsic motivation and then punishing them if they slip into it despite all that. Yet another reason to escape or reduce dependence on the modern work environment, if you can swing it. Let's define what I mean when I say freedom or sovereignty here. Because don't most of us listening all live in an ostensibly and reasonably free society? We can worship whatever gods we like and write mean things about politicians on the clear net. Isn't that enough? Well, no. I mean, it's great. And look, if you don't have those things... This podcast is pretty irrelevant. Like, you need, you know, political and religious freedom and stuff like that. But our culture has caused us to forge invisible cages around our own lives. These cages are built by the consumer mindset, the idea that we need money to solve all our problems. And it's that cage, that mindset, that I see as the current major source of unfreedom in the world. And that source of unfreedom is what I'm really interested in in undoing. So to me, the measure of one's freedom isn't in how much money you make or have, it's in how bought into the consumer mindset you are. If you're technically financially independent, meaning you have enough money for the rest of your life, but you still hold the belief that your quality of life is tied only to money, then in my mind, you're not free. You're not free to do whatever you want. You're not free to take intellectual risks and stick your neck out there. You're not free to really let your gifts for the world flourish. You're not as free as you could be. You're not as free as we need you to be. The flip side is just because you aren't financially independent necessarily doesn't mean you aren't free. Look, if you've got your mindset right so you can get whatever money you need as an incidental yield from doing the work you were born to do, from doing what you want to do, what 
fills you with stoke. And if you don't see money as the only way to solve problems, then you're well on your road to being free, I think. Creative Commons music by Jason Shaw over at audionautics.com. My website is tylerjdisney.com. You can sign up for my newsletter at the bottom of any page. Thanks for listening. <laughs>